Um, so I'm Julia Kalkman, and my talk today is about so-called proper noun modifiers, uh, such as the Obama government and the Wembley Stadium uh, in English. And my talk uh, taps into an area of linguistics called grammatical variation, which, according to a standard definition, involves two or more ways of saying the same thing. So let me give you an example of what is meant by this. Um, so here in one, we have a short excerpt from a novel which reads as follows. Uh, there was a rather cryptic exchange at the Myers dinner party between him and Hillary Roberts. Rickards crouched forward, his huge hand cradling the whiskey glass. Without looking up, he said, the Maya dinner party. I reckon that cozy little gathering, if it was cozy, is at the nub of this case. So we can see that um, the two constructions, the Maya's dinner party on the one hand and the Maya dinner party on the other are in variation here because they both mean the same thing in that they both refer to a dinner party hosted by the Mayas, but they look different from a grammatical point of view. So um, the first construction, the Maya's dinner party is what I'll be referring to as proper noun genitives or P and genitives for short. And the second construction, the Maya dinner party, is what I'll be referring to as proper noun modifiers or P and modifiers um, for short. So before we carry on, I'd like to actually do a little poll with you to see um, how solid this alternation is once we look at more examples. So in other words, I'd like us to think about whether P and genitives and P and modifiers always express the same meaning. So Take a moment to read through these two sets of sentences and vote by the poll whether you think Obama's government and the Obama government and Ghana's problem and the Ghana problem mean the same thing. It looks like most of you um, agree that Obama's government and the Obama government are equivalent in meaning, whereas Ghana's problem and the Ghana problem are not. And that's correct, because Ghana's problem is a problem incurred by Ghana, whereas the Ghana problem could also be interpreted as a problem that is incurred by another entity, but concerning Ghana. So um, in linguistics, uh, we call these paraphrasing relationships, such as led by or incurred by that we've just talked about, semantic relations which is a term I'll be using quite a lot in my talk today. So semantic relations, as I use them here, are the relationships which hold between the two nouns, and we call them semantic relations because they're essentially meaning relations in more um, informal terms. Right, so coming back to the question of how solid the alternation between P and genitives and uh, P and modifiers is, we've uh, seen that it works in some cases, but not in others, which is basically pure honey for a linguist interested in grammatical variation. And um, so these similarities and differences in uh, the alternation potential between P and genitives and P and modifiers then kind of prompted us to dive a bit deeper into their meaning. So um, we were interested uh, in whether semantic relations are the key to this seemingly erratic behavior. In other words, is it the case that PN modifiers like the Ghana problem are better suited to expressing something like the theme relation we see in this noun phrase, where Ghana is the theme or, or the topic of the problem, but the problem is actually experienced by uh, another entity? So to answer this question, we specified two more concrete uh, research questions. Uh, first, we wanted to know which semantic relations the two constructions can express full stop. And this was motivated by the fact that um, while there had actually been a lot of uh, research already into P and genitives, we didn't know very much at the time about what kinds of semantic relations P and modifiers could express. And the second thing we wanted to know is which semantic relations they share and which they don't. And in the case of which semantic relations we maintain meaning uh, equivalence. So what did we do? Um, well, we conducted an experimental um, questionnaire based study, which was based on a previous corpus study of proper noun modifiers that we conducted in 2015 where we looked at the kinds of discourse environments that um, these kinds of modifiers were found in. Um, and that was just to get a first overview of how they pattern and what meanings they can express. And I'll say a bit more about the corpus aspect um, of our study shortly, but uh, for now, we ended up with a total of 109 native speakers of English. So a really good amount of data in the end, which I remember took us a very long time to analyze. Um, let me also say a few words about the data we used in the actual um, 
experimental study. So remember that we wanted to look at um, the alternation potential between PN modifiers and PN genitives. And as is normal in studies of grammatical variation, we couldn't just include any noun phrase that looked like a PN modifier, but had to actually restrict ourselves, um, amongst other things, to those indefinite noun phrases. So that's because proper noun genitives are by definition definite, so you wouldn't get variation between something like a London Museum and London's Museum, for example, and I hope you all agree on that. Um, we also went for PN modifiers with an identifying function only because they share this with PN genitives again. And this simply means that a, a noun phrase like the London Museum uh, or London's Museum picks out or identifies a specific salient entity. So we excluded uh, PN modifiers with a um, so-called classifying function such as Yorkshire Terrier, which wouldn't paraphrase as Yorkshire Terrier, and also those with a descriptive function um, such as Mona Lisa Smile, which wouldn't paraphrase as Mona Lisa Smile when used with this function. Okay, so before I say exactly what we asked our participants to do in this study, let me show you the kinds of sentences we had them uh, look at. So in total, we used uh, 20 sentences, um, all of which we took from the British National Corpus. Um, and a lot of studies in the area of grammatical variation actually use made up examples, but we weren't interested in sort of alternation possibilities in the abstract, but we wanted to probe actual language use. And so some of these um, examples allowed only the P and genitive construction. Um, and here is an example that you can um, have a look at. And some allowed only the P and modifier construction. And again, here is another example um, to support that. Um, and the rest then allowed both. Um, so I'm not gonna read these out now due to time constraints, but you can check this um, for yourself later um, if you're interested. Um, okay, so right, what did we actually um, ask participants to do? Well, um, we asked them to read the following sentence and indicate how naturally they thought each of the phrases would fill the indicate, indicated gap on a ranking between one and 10. And if they thought um, both were equally natural, they could give them the same score. So this sentence here is one of the examples from the corpus, but we blanked out the um, construction that was actually used and got participants then to rate how natural the PN genitive or the PN modifier respectively sounded here. And if participants rated one or both of the constructions above three, we asked them to paraphrase them on the next screen, um, which we'll look at now. So here, um, most of the participants chose the PN genitive, Northern Ireland's experience, and were then asked to express the relationship between um, experience and Northern Ireland using um, this template below. And here we were, of course, interested um, in semantic relations, uh, which I'll um, come to now. So, um, well, what did we then have to do actually as researchers once we, we got all of these responses from our participants? Well, um, we had to essentially uh, code the different paraphrases that were given to us. Um, and you can imagine um, how many we had to deal with given that we had 20 examples and 109 participants. Um, so what we did, and, and this is what I mean by code, um, was to group the different paraphrases uh, into seven major uh, semantic relations. Um, and I'm just going to detail one of them now to save time. So for the sentence containing the PN genitive, Edward's affair, for example, uh, participants use paraphrases like the affair that Edward committed uh, or the affair that was carried out by Edward. And we group those into the semantic relation actor because there is an element of um, Edward doing something or acting on something here. And um, the others, as you can see here, are called undergoer, possessor, location, name, involvement, and um, beneficiary. Okay, so this is then what we did uh, in terms of sort of how we, how we dealt with all the different responses we got. Um, and I would now like to look at our hypotheses and results. So um, the first hypothesis we came up with was about possible semantic relations. Um, and based on the corpus study, um, we hypothesized that only the PN modifier construction could convey the name relation, as in um, the Subway sandwich shop, which could be paraphrased as something like the sandwich shop that is called Subway or whatever. Um, so we didn't actually find a single PN genitive in the corpus study which conveyed this relation, uh, hence this hypothesis. Um, for the actor relation, 
we found in the corpus study that this um, exclusively clustered with the PN genitive construction, as in Glasgow's move, uh, the move that was made by Glasgow, for example. Uh, the location and involvement relations, on the other hand, were only found with the PN modifier construction, as in the California desert, the desert that is located in California, um, and the Kobe Bryant case, the case that involves Kobe Bryant. Um, and we'd also actually use the involvement relation for our previous um, example, the Ghana problem, by the way. So if it's true that this is limited to the PN modifier construction, that could then potentially explain why the PN genitive variant Ghana's problem isn't a good paraphrase. So that was sort of our, our reasoning behind this. Um, what did we find? Well, Firstly, that the PN genitive construction can also convey name, as in the Kobe Bryant case, where some participants ranked Kobe Bryant's case as a natural filler and paraphrased it as the case that is named after Kobe Bryant. Um, we also found, contrary to expectations, that the involvement interpretation wasn't limited to the PN modifier construction, but was also chosen uh, for the PN genitive construction. So some participants um, paraphrased Kobe Bryant's case as the case that involved or was about Kobe Bryant. And sometimes um, this was even paraphrased using the actor relation, as in the case that Kobe Bryant led, um, but that was probably due to limited background knowledge, which I'll say something more about in a moment. So generally speaking, the first um, hypothesis wasn't supported by our data. Okay, the second hypothesis um, we came up with concerns the alternation potential between PN genitives and PN modifiers. Uh, and we anticipated that, for example, falling into the PN genitive only and PN modifier only groups, so those where no alternation was possible, participants would naturally rate one of the two constructions very high and the other much lower. And in the third group where alternation is possible, we anticipated that participants would rate both constructions uh, similarly. The results were again, not as we'd hypothesized. Um, there was a bit of a continuum in each set of examples and um, the ratings differed somewhat from example to example. Uh, I won't go into the details of this as I don't really have much time, but the actual ratings um, can be found in a, in a nice big table. Um, which is actually easy to read, uh, that's the good news, um, in, in the paper, um, for those of you who are interested. Um, more generally, uh, though, um, the PN genitive only example showed a large difference between the ratings for the PN genitive and the uh, PN modifier and a lower rating for the undesired option than the PN modifier only cases. And we put this down to the fact that participants perhaps have a better grasp of the PN genitive construction as it's used more frequently uh, than the PN modifier construction and so can maybe differentiate uh, its meaning more clearly from that of an equivalent PN modifier. But that's just sort of, you know, us thinking about the, the reason for this and, and we weren't entirely sure actually um, what this was all about. Um, okay. So before I summarize, uh, I wanted to show you some unexpected results, starting with a couple of examples where alternation was in principle possible. So for the California desert versus California's desert, um, participants somehow preferred the California desert. Um, and we put that down to the different paraphrases assigned to each variant, uh, namely is in California for the PN modifier variant, which is a location reading um, and belongs to California for the PN genitive variant, which is a possessor reading. And what's really interesting, I think, to note here is that the semantic uh, relations assigned to each noun phrase appear to be completely context dependent and not uniform across uh, participants. And this is something I'll come back to again at the end of the talk. Um, and, and really quite similarly, participants preferred Thatcher's government over the Thatcher government. And we saw many actor type paraphrases here, such as belong to Thatcher and was led by Thatcher which um, we'll see actually more preferentially associated with the PN genitive construction. Um, okay, so for the um, PN genitive only and PN modifier only cases, we sometimes found that participants use the unexpected variant uh, due to lack of context and background knowledge. You know, to give just one example, um, in nine here, we were expecting participants to pick the PN modifier variant, the Kashmir problem, rather than the PN genitive variant, Kashmir's problem. But in actual fact, a lot of participants did pick the PN genitive variant uh, and paraphrase it as a problem that was incurred by Kashmir, not realizing that the Kashmir problem is actually one that revolves around Kashmir. So in a way, 
I think using actual corpus examples turned out to be a, a disadvantage in cases like this because we didn't give enough context uh, and just relied on participants having the, the relevant background knowledge. Um, okay, so to come back to our first uh, research question, um, we found that in principle, all seven relations can be expressed by both constructions with none actually being restricted to either construction. Um, so it's not the case that the two constructions are associated with a particular finite set of semantic relations. Um, and I'll say more about this in a moment. So in terms of um, what semantic relations are shared between the two constructions, um, given the first finding, it's clear that generally all of them are shared. Um, but we did find a number of preferred associations between certain relations and either of the two constructions. So um, as you can see here in, in this diagram, um, possessor and actor cluster more closely with the P and genitive um, and name uh, clusters more closely with the P and modifier. And then there are various relations sort of somewhere in the middle, like beneficiary and undergoer and location um, and involvement. Good, so what are some of the take home messages from the study? Uh, well, first off, I think the term semantic relations is actually a bit of a misnomer um, because these kind of uh, paraphrasing relations are not part of the lexis of the constructions but have to be worked out on a case by case basis. So they should be more aptly called pragmatic relations. And we saw this in numerous examples, um, right? Where participants gave slightly different interpretations of one and the same noun phrase. So we can actually say that both constructions are to some extent underspecified from the point of view of their meaning, and they kind of have to be worked out um, in context or pragmatically in actual sort of language use. And um, an interesting consequence of this is that semantic relations alone can't really account for the variation between PN genitives and PN modifiers, because neither construction, as we said, comes with a predefined set of expressible meanings. So yes, there may be default associations, but uh, they're crucially not absolute. And we really need to also look to other factors in order uh, to be able to predict which of the two constructions is chosen in which context. So these may include genre. Um, so it's common for PN modifiers to be used in newspaper headlines, for example, um, as well as formality. So um, Quite interestingly, we had some comments from participants saying that they thought the PN modifier sounded more formal than the PN genitive, for example. And the extension task that, that our colleague Ben has prepared for this talk will actually get you to think a bit about these kinds of considerations. Okay, so I'll end here uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.